This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 680. If you are a, a host or a property management company that is looking to grow and scale, and if you are so more than 90% reliant on one channel for your revenue coming in, you're playing a very dicey, dangerous game. Because all it takes is for your account to get hacked, your listing to get locked down, or a couple of crappy reviews, or a, a total algorithm change by Airbnb where suddenly you're on page one and the next day you're on page five or six where nobody looks. So it's, it's really important that we flip that around and we look to get everybody to a 65% direct and then a 35% relying on third parties, aka OTAs. Hello everyone, I'm your host, David Green of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here today with my lovely co-host, Robert Abasolo. In today's show, we're going to be interviewing Mark Simpson, owner of Boosley, and UK resident who has some fantastic advice for us on how to book your short-term rentals without using the online travel agencies, Airbnb, VRBO, and their ilk. Rob, first off, how are you today? And second, what do you think about the show? That was okay. First of all, my, my hat's off to you because you really went all in on that. And uh, we did it all in one take. You know, most of the time that we would do that five times, but you nailed it first time. So today's episode is really great, man. I'm super excited. We even get to hear me dabble a little bit with my accent repertoire. And we get into the art of hosting and the idea of getting into direct bookings and when you should possibly consider making your own direct booking website over just staying on all the typical OTAs online travel agencies out there. So I'm excited to jump into it because I think if you're if you listen to today's episode and you're a short-term rental host, it might it might crack your brain a little bit, you know, and you might think, "Okay, maybe I should try maybe I should try something else. Maybe I should diversify a little bit." Well, if we're just being honest, this is a very relevant topic in the short-term rental space and so much of real estate investing is starting to become dominated by the short-term rental space. This is what everybody's talking about. This is where the highest returns are. In a lot of ways, this is sort of the future of real estate investing is you got to do more than just buy a property, set it and forget it. You got to learn how to host something, create an experience and outshine your competition. And in today's show, Mark gives us some examples of how to do just that. Mark actually came from a background of hospitality. He grew up with people in his house as they ran a bed and breakfast, and his mind was formed and sort of forged in the fires of hospitality. And he gives us some tremendous advice for what you can do to make your place stand out. And frankly, I think if you're going to try to be in this space in the future, you have to know how to do it without relying on Airbnb or VRBO. Rob, you could probably speak to this better than anyone, but it's getting harder and harder to stand out on those sites. Airbnb recently just redid their whole algorithm. And people's entire business models were shaken as they're trying to now scramble and figure out, how do I make my place unique? How do I make it different? How do I make it like, what's the word that you're like, glitchy sort of so that it can stand out with Airbnb? What's your experience been like since they switched things up? Um, you know what? It's still it's still the same thing, right? We're still booking and everything, but there's a game to it, right? All algorithms out there, whether it's YouTube or Airbnb, there's a game that you got to play and you got to play by their rules. So that'll actually, you know what? I think that's a good segue, David, into today's quick, 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 quick tip. Uh, <laughs> pretty good. Pretty good. I like, I like the combo here. So today's quick tip is really going to be to diversify where you're listing your short-term rentals. I know as hosts, a lot of the times our go-to is going to be Airbnb, but it's really smart to consider putting your different uh, units and homes on other websites, Airbnb, Verbo, Booking.com, and even considering going direct, right? Direct booking website where people can directly book from you and you can cut out the middleman and be sort of the customer service. You can be the person that's dictating all the fees. You can be the person that's providing that one-on-one -on -one experience with your guests. I think that this is very important and relevant today because I've just seen a lot of people getting locked out of their different accounts on several OTAs. And when that happens, it can be a really big stressful moment for you and your business. But if you diversify and you have your short-term rental listed on different websites, if one of those websites crashes or goes down or locks you out, you still can get booked on all the other different websites out there. So diversify as you move into your short-term rental journey. Absolutely. I love it. And this is sort of cutting edge information that we're sharing with you here at Bigger Pockets because we love you. And with that, let's bring in today's featured guest, Boost Lizon, Mark Simpson. So, Mark, welcome to the Bigger Pockets podcast. How are you today? I'm amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Nice to speak to, to you two today. Yeah. First off, I want to compliment you on your hair and your beard. I, I You've inspired me. I may copy it. It looks incredible on you. You know, I went to the barber shop today and said, can I have the David? 
And he mm. just said, I know what you mean to David Green. And he just went, he said, say no more, fam. That's say when no you more. know that you have made it. When first off, you're known by one name, right? Madonna, Fabio, <laughs> J-Lo. <laughs> when you're known by one name, you know you're famous. Now, Mark, I understand that you and Rob have a previously established relationship. So I'm a bit of the third wheel here. Can you tell our audience how you two know each other? So um, I can go first, Rob, if you, if, if you like. Um, I... Uh, I've been a massive fan of Rob's channel um, for about, I'd say the last year and a half. I've been really digging into it. And um, I've just been, every now and again, when something comes up on Instagram, I slide in the DMs and just saying, hey, you know, m- massive fan, uh, da, 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 da. As our relationship grew and he started to actually look at the messages because he gets so many, I, uh, <laughs> I said, hey, let's have a chat about direct booking sometimes. And, you know, uh, every single time, I've seen videos this year in 2022 of, of, uh, of bigger pockets. And anytime Rob talks about direct bookings, I've slowly seen him get a bit more gentler towards it. And I like to feel like my influence in the DMS has been like a little part of that to where, um, now we're sort of doing little bits together behind the scenes and, and super excited. But I do actually have an Instagram story about you, David. I actually sent you a message, uh, about a couple of months ago and it was just as I feel like me and Rob were starting to chat. And I said, oh, because you followed me on Instagram. And I was like, oh, no way. Mr. David Green's following me. So I sent a little message back saying, hey, massive fan. Thank you very much for the follow. And then you send back a reply, which is kind of like, hey. And I was like, oh, that's a bit, he must be busy. You know, it's a very like short, sharp message and sent a couple of more messages back and forth. And then all of a sudden you sent me a message back and it started talking about crypto. Well, this is taking a turn for the, this is taking a turn. So b- before I knew it, I was giving over my Bitcoin wallet and uh, the rest is history. But it turns out it wasn't you, good sir. It turns out I was chatting to a David Green impersonator. <laughs> and now and now Mark lives under a bridge. <laughs> and now I have to sell everything. <laughs> yeah. And yet Instagram still just won't give me the freaking blue check mark. It's like, oh, how many people have to get ripped off from this? I've tried about 25 times. So say la vie. Here we are. Well, I'm sorry about that, Mark. Hopefully you didn't spend any money. (laughs) I'm good. No, I think he was just kidding. Yeah, um, but I did. I've sent you several Bitcoin, David. I'd like that returned, please. Uh, (laughs) So yeah, I got locked out of Airbnb like not too long ago for a very short amount of time. I think it was for less than a week. But that's a a big deal for Airbnb hosts, short-term rental hosts altogether. I've been seeing more stories like this pop up. My students have been locked out. And yeah, Mark Mark has been very... um, He's been very tenacious, I guess, on Instagram. And we would chat and back and forth. And then all of a sudden, I got locked out. And I was like, wait a minute. I know a guy. I know a guy that is all about direct booking so that this never happens again. So it all kind of came together and culminated into a beautiful, beautiful relationship. And uh, fast forward to today, he was speaking to my students not too long ago and actually delivered a Chipotle burrito to me in the middle of the presentation. And he instructed the Uber Eats eater specifically to interrupt my Zoom presentation when the burrito got here. So I ate a burrito on camera not too long ago. And uh, that's our relationship. You really are, Rob, like the personification of a millennial in so many ways. (laughs) You're like the shirt you're wearing right now, your very eccentric hairstyle, your obsession with Chipotle for 80% of your dietary needs. You've got that millennial thing like... You got it down really, really good. But Mark, I don't know you and I want to know a little bit more about you. So tell us, I'm fascinated. Other than where do you live and where does that accent come from? How did you get started in real estate? Like how did you, what is your story, your origin story of how you ended up getting your first house? Yeah, so um, I've pretty much been born into hospitality, um, pretty much. I I grew up on a 200 acre farm in the middle of nowhere in in the United Kingdom. As you can tell, this accent um, is over the pond. So I'm from the UK grew up on a farm. And in the nineties, my parents turned a 200 acre farm and they converted a barn and put a bed and breakfast on it. And then they converted another barn and put some holiday cottages. And this is before the time of social media. This is before the time of Airbnb and and all that good stuff. And and they literally relied on uh, very old school methods to advertise their business. It was word of mouth and it was magazine advertisements and newspaper advertisements. And I just grew up in a world where I was so used to strangers being in our house, being in my kitchen, you know, all 24, seven, seven days a week. And I, uh, I grew up like serving breakfasts and doing all of the things before school. And then eventually as I grew older, uh, I had a, I had an opportunity to, um, sort of move away from the farm and do soccer coaching and spent pretty much the, my sort of 
20s, traveling around America, coaching soccer, an amazing time. Um, then eventually moved back to the UK. And that's when I came back into the business. It was me and my wife and, and my eldest. We moved back into the family business in 2011. And by this point, they'd had it for 25 years. They were still doing everything pen and paper. And my job was to get it online. Um, being a millennial, my parents looked at me like, well, you, you've you been on the internet once. You should know how to do this. So I, uh, and that's literally what we did. We, we, we grew that offline word of mouth and put it online and utilized uh, online reviews. We, we utilized Facebook and social media to, to grow the business as well as the online travel agents. Um, in the UK, booking.com is probably the biggest, was the biggest. And Airbnb has slowly been playing catch up over the years. But we built up a, a business where we didn't rely on Airbnb. We, we focused on our direct bookings and we grew that. And um, yeah, and then to fast forward to 2016, uh, I started to go to hospitality meetups in our area, in, in, a, in the area of Scarborough, United Kingdom, and started to chat to other hosts, other hosts that were either one property in or five or 10 properties in. And the big annoyance there was they were having to sort of rely on booking.com and, and the whatnots for their bookings. And that's when I started doing uh, doing doing Boostly. That's when I sort of started helping hosts sort of figure out how they can generate their own bookings and not have to rely on, on, on Airbnb or booking.com. It sounds like you're out there doing God's work, and I want to thank you for that. So uh, Rob actually called me the other night in a complete panic, as he often does, two o'clock in the morning, freaking out. And uh, he told me a story about a guest we had at our Scottsdale property that wasn't happy. Actually, he wasn't in a panic at all. It was one of those like, if I had hair, I would be pulling it out of my head. I have another person asking for a discount over nothing. And apparently this guest had actually pulled a gun on our cleaners and then had the audacity to turn around and ask us for a discount. And Rob was like, and you know what? I had to freaking give it to him because you get in this position with Airbnb where you're being held hostage. And if you don't give this person what they want, they threaten you with the bad review. You end up playing this really, uh, I don't know, like just disastrous game of chicken with the guests where Airbnb has to figure this problem out because sometimes you're a normal person. Like I've never even thought of asking for a discount. If I go to an Airbnb and they run out of toilet paper, I just go buy more. I don't think about threatening the person with a bad review if they don't give me what I want or hand delivering toilet paper, but I'm finding out many people do. And it sounds like it's turning in some ways into Craigslist where like uh, you're what you, you're offering a bicycle for $200 and someone offers you 75 bucks. And it, that's just, it's like a bidding war. It turns into an auction. So I wanted to ask you, Rob, not just with our house, but with your experience on Airbnb in general, how big of a problem is the threats of bad reviews and, and hurting your standings with getting bookings and how important is a direct booking system like what Mark is talking about to uh, the uh, operator's chances of success. I have always considered wa like Airbnb walking on a tightrope of sorts where it's just a game of, of balance, right? It is a hospitality business. And so in some regards, I do feel like uh, Airbnb, which I use synonymously with just any OTA. OTA stands for Online Travel Agency. I'm sure we'll use that term several times today. But in any platform, whether it's Airbnb, Verbo, Booking.com, there is some push and pull here with customer service and the checks and balances of the different securities that they that they offer to their hosts and everything like that. And it does force me to stay very hospitable, right? Keep up the, hospital the hospitality aspect of my business. I'm happy to do that. But there is a very interesting moment where, yeah, you know, this guest, a guest might damage something. They might leave you damages anywhere from 50 to 500 bucks. Usually anything that's under $50, I'm not really going to charge a guest back for. But over $50, it starts getting kind of hairy, right? And it's like 51 bucks. I don't know. Am I really going to charge a guest for that? $75. And as hosts, we get very scared to charge that back to the guest, even though it's within our right to do it. Because the moment you send a guest a message and say, hey, you stained our rug, it's going to be 75 bucks to get it spot cleaned or whatever then now they have a tainted experience at your place, right? They'll be like, oh, come on, it was an accident or whatever. It was just a wine glass. You really want to charge me for that? And so you get into this this uh, this mindset where you ask yourself, is, is charging a guest $50 worth a four-star review? And if you're just starting out your Airbnb business or your Airbnb listing, 
it's not worth it, right? Because if you have five five star reviews and then one four star review, guess what? Your your ranking just went down to like a four point seven or a four point seven five, all because a guest and it was their fault broke something in your house and you charge them for it and it forced them to think of all the negative things that happened during their stay when it would have just been a five-star stay otherwise. So this is a huge pain point for Airbnb hosts. And that's just on small things, right? But then you get into other situations like the, you know, the Scottsdale guest that you're talking about, David, where they smoked a bunch of pot in the house and it smells like pot in there right now. And that can affect future bookings and that can leave a bad experience for other people. We got to charge these people, right? 500 bucks, whatever, to fumigate it, do the ozone treatment and all that stuff. And now we know that they're probably not going to leave us a five-star review. Um, so it's a whole thing, right? It's like the customer service aspect of Airbnb. It's a hospitality business. But it, at the end of the day, it's still a business, right? And you still do have to make money. So yeah, when when you're kind of at the mercy of the checks and balances of OTAs, it kind of makes it tough to, to be profitable in cert- certain situations, if that makes sense. So here's my understanding of how OTAs have sort of evolved over the years, Mark, and I want to get your professional opinion on if I'm accurate. At first, people put a house on VRBO, Airbnb, it booked like hotcakes. You almost couldn't miss in the in the short-term rental space. Everyone was crushing it. The money started to move in that direction. The market got really hot. It became hard to get cash flow of any kind if you weren't doing short-term rentals. And so more and more people got into this space. Now it's become somewhat saturated. In some areas, you're okay. But in others, you're competing with other people over these guests. And it's pushing the prices down to the point. It's almost not making sense. And now you're at a point where the tenant has the leverage in the relationship. There, they get to choose which properties they want to book. They get to ask for discounts. If they come, they break the rules. You're afraid to say anything because you don't want a bad review. The owners of these properties, not only do they have to deal with problems of neighbors, problems of the possible city changing regulations, the evil landlord clause that sort of reigns over the industry right now, and the tenants having power, you seem like you figured out a way around that. Like, just don't go through those means where you don't have the leverage. First off, am I accurate with my understanding of the evolution of the industry? And then second, what is Boostly now doing to try to fix this? Yeah, no, you're 100% spot on. And for a lot of people, and especially a lot of people who are coming into the industry right now, believe it or not, there was a time in this industry that was before Airbnb, before OTAs, before Instant Book. I mean, 2015, you go on to any of these online travel agents and it was request a book. So you even like early days, Airbnb, there was no instant book. The, the, the only reason that they bought that in was to compete with booking.com, which is the booking holidays group and Verbo, which was home away, which is the Expedia group, which owns Expedia and all, all that jazz. And with instant book coming in and with commission, being a big thing because back in the day as well, to be on a listing site, you paid an annual subscription fee. But then people started to come along like booking.com, et cetera, and say, hey, don't pay as any annual subscription fee, just pay as a commission if a booking comes in. And for a first time host, it's like, wow, this is, this is amazing. For, for marketing and for advertising, if it doesn't work, I don't have to pay any money. And we are in an industry and I class hospitality, short-term rentals, mid-term rentals, whatever you want to call it. All of this is hospitality as as Rob alluded to. And in this hospitality industry, we're we're in the industry of making memories. So it's not like when you buy some from Amazon, it's just a one-off purchase. That's fine. We are in an industry where people literally come and stay with you and they will remember it for years. They will talk about it with with their family, with their friends, et cetera. And because of that, it is so in demand. Like, you both now can look at your calendar and you'll just know there's dates in that calendar for all your properties that you could book three or four times over depending on the time of the year. And because it is so in demand, it is so easy to get bookings. And Airbnb, booking.com, Verbo have marketed and spent billions making sure that they are in the right product placement. So again, when you first start and you've got that one property and you've got all those plates that are spinning, everything that you have to know to do, when it comes to marketing, you can just take a couple of pictures on your phone you can upload it to a website, Airbnb, and be pretty much be guaranteed to get bookings. And because it is so easy, you then become over over complacent and lazy and over reliant on one platform. And it and it really becomes a problem when. So it becomes a problem when, for example, you're you get a bad review from a guest, or you know a guest complains to Airbnb and they side with the guest, or for what for whatever reason your listing gets taken down. And and it's happening more and more and more now. And if you are a host or a property management company 
that is looking to grow and scale. And if you are so more than 90% reliant on one channel for your revenue coming in, you're playing a very dicey, dangerous game because all it takes is for your account to get hacked, your listener to get locked down or a couple of crappy reviews or a, a total algorithm change by Airbnb where suddenly you're on page one and the next day you're on page five or six where nobody looks. So it's it's really important that we flip that around and we look to get everybody to a 65% direct and then at 35% relying on third parties, I, aka OTAs. Yeah, do you want to add to that list? Because you were saying all it takes is a hack or this or that. It also takes things that are not even like actual problem like okay let me articulate this correctly we had a bed bug scare in one of our properties like i don't know three or four months ago maybe five months ago and the guest sent over a photo of a bug and uh, we sent that over to our, our pest control people were like oh, oh my gosh is, is it a bed bug and they're like we don't think so but we'll we'll go check so they go and they report that to Airbnb, obviously. I mean, you know, I don't necessarily blame them for that. But Airbnb immediately locked that listing. They deactivated the listing. And then we got the pest control people to come out. And then the pest control people were like, oh, actually, it's not bed bugs. It's, it's a thing called bat bugs. Easy to treat. They kind of fought all, you know, found all the different places to plug the home. All that type of stuff. We had it resolved in, in you know, a day or two. But even with that, we had to submit like a report that basically vowed that we didn't have bed bugs and we had to do all this stuff. And that account could not be booked or that listing could not be booked for six weeks. And that was a, a property that we had with an investor. So we're over here scrambling, trying to like, you know, make it happen as much as possible. Luckily it did end up getting resolved. We've been booking like hotcakes otherwise. And like, you know, we, we still are making a lot of money on that property, but you know, for people that are just starting out, if that's your first experience with a short-term rental, that can really taint the rest of your of your journey, right? And so, luckily, you know, I've done this a while now, so I'm able to stay calm whenever there's a bed bug scare, whenever a guest pulls a gun out on our cleaner, uh, all that kind of stuff. It doesn't phase me quite as much, but it is interesting to hear you say that, Mark, because really, at the end of the day, using different OTAs like Airbnb and Verbo that it gives the guest all the leverage. They have all the leverage to basically do whatever they want. There's some good and some bad, right? You know, with uh, short-term rentals in general, like Airbnb, they're going to bring the marketing, right? They're going to bring you the guests. You don't have to go and market your listing. But certainly now, as I've done this for five, six years, I'm definitely starting to feel this this stat of 65% direct bookings that, you're, that, that you kind of referenced there. Because yeah, it does make sense to kind of bring it all in-house at the end of the day. Yeah. And I feel like... the. A, a, it all boils down to when you are so reliant on Airbnb for your bookings, you literally have a boss at that point and you are literally building your house and your business on somebody else's land because they can turn around at any point and change the rules. Or like you said, if a guest books through there and they complain to Airbnb, they are going to always side with the guest over the host. doesn't matter what you've got systems and things in place. It, it, it just happens more often than not. And it's, and it's scary to see. Now, if a guest books direct with you and you've got your systems and structures in place, which is what we will talk about, then that situation with the bed bug, you would have had direct communication with the guests right there and then. You could have sorted it on your terms, on your rules, and you're not then having to have that little niggling doubt in your head that there's going to be somebody looking over you, making all of the making all of the calls and the decisions, and you're worried about it. And the best example I can give on this, and one that I feel that any host that's been around since 2019 will be able to relate to, is that in March 2020, when the world went a little bit upside down and all of these um, regulations and rules were starting to put in place, Airbnb in the middle of March just sent a notification out to all guests and all hosts at the same time. So no word of warning to hosts, to everybody at the same point, everybody woke up with a notification saying that obviously with everything that's going on in the world, any guests can cancel their stay free of charge. doesn't matter what the policy is. Now that ended up ending so many management companies and host businesses because they just couldn't they couldn't, they couldn't survive it because straight away guests went and canceled. There's no warning to hosts. Now the kickback to, that I get when I talk about that story is, well, just because a guest book direct doesn't mean they, they didn't cancel. Yeah, sure. But what we did at our family business is on that, you know, in March, we were able to have the phone number and the email address of every guest that had booked with us direct. All we did is we called them. We, we literally called them. We're real vulnerable and just said, Hey, you know, everything that's going on in the world, obviously you've got a, a, a booking coming up with us. Um, obviously you can't make it, but instead of canceling it, let's change it. So we, we adopted a change, not cancel approach. And we were able to save 
five figures in reservations and just move it to later on in a year or next year. And we're able to help get us through that part. Guests and hosts that relied solely on Airbnb weren't so lucky. They literally had no way of communicating with the guests because Airbnb don't share email addresses. They don't like you communicating with the guests. And and those that were reliant solely on on one platform didn't make it out the other end. And, And this is why it's really important that we actually now start to turn this around. And this is why I'm trying to help 1 million hosts cut down on that over reliance on, on the OTAs, because if we can do so, if we can do this and we will get a foot at the table at these at these OTAs. At the moment, they all of these Airbnb, Booking.com, Verbo, they look at hosts as just a number. They just look a number of part of their massive stock list. <laughs> we are not partners, as they keep saying, partners with inverted commas. We, we have to get aware of them. And the, at the moment, they don't think that hosts, as in Airbnb hosts, want to do their own direct bookings. So it's you know, I'm, I'm a stubborn Yorkshireman <laughs> and I want to show them that we can do this. It is simple to do this. And my whole thing is about going old school to go new school. So what old school tactics can we do to drive in, to drive in, uh, to drive in bookings and revenue? Yeah. So no, knowing what you know here, I mean, obviously, you know, that the hosts are a number and everything like that. Would you say, is there a dystopian outlook for using one or two major listing websites? Yeah. Um, so very recently, Skift, which is a big uh, industry publication, put out a, a graph and it showed the reliance on where the bookings are going on these platforms. And they took the top five and um, the, out, out of the top five was the free standout. So Airbnb, Booking.com and Verbo. And in 2017, Airbnb had 15% of the market. So 2017, about five years ago, they had 15% of the market. The, the way that the graph is going, the prediction is by 2025, so only a couple of years away, they'll have 60% of the market. Airbnb are cat, not only playing catch up, they're going to dominate this industry in terms of where the bookings are coming from. Like my belief and my opinion is, is that Airbnb want to become the Amazon of the, the short-term rental industry. And if they get to that point, there's nothing from stopping them from turning around to hosts all on their platform and saying, you know what, Dave, Rob, uh, we feel like this relationship isn't, isn't you know accurate, isn't fair. You know, you only pay us say 14% commission uh, at, at the present moment in time. Let's bump that up to 20. Let's bump that up to 25, 30, 40, 50%. You know, Amazon, uh, they take up to 66% commission for everything that is sold on that platform. That, that is crazy. And there's nothing from stopping from Airbnb doing something similar. And they're making all of the rules tighter, tighter, tighter. And, you know, at the moment, we're lucky. At the moment, we still, you know, some hosts only pay 3% commission. If you're a pro host, you have to, you have to pay a little bit more. If you connected up to a, a property management software that we're going to talk about soon, you've got to pay a little bit more. But the worry is, is that it becomes, this industry becomes so reliant on Airbnb that they can dictate the rules at any point. And when that happens, and it's bad enough now, if that happens in the future, then more and more hosts are going to be going out of business or having to pay deep, deep commission costs for something that is simple that we can stop now by starting to think about marketing ourselves, marketing our own businesses, which is what every other industry needs to do. Like we do website design at Boostly. There's no listing site that I can go and put Boostly websites on and generate revenue. You know, I have to brand myself. I have to go on podcasts and do all of the social media things. Short-term rental hosts have to start doing that now if we don't want to go down that route of being very reliant on Airbnb. 100%. I mean, you're talking about marketing your listing, right? If you want to market your listing out to the masses, I know that you have to have an ideal audience or demographic or kind of uh, you know avatar in mind. And I've heard you say that most people don't know their potential guest avatar. So do you think you could just really briefly explain what this means and why why would not knowing your avatar be impacting your bookings? Yeah, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great point and it's a great question. And, and when you say avatar, I guarantee there's going to be so many listening to this or watching this will be like, what is even an avatar? And the most simplest way to put it in terms of hospitality, short-term rentals, is it you're the ideal guest that you want to walk through the door. And when you really nail down who that, who that avatar, who that ideal guest is, it makes everything so much easier. Because at the end of the day, you haven't got an Etsy store, you haven't got an Amazon store, you haven't got unlimited downloads. You know, there's only a certain amount of heads that you can fit on bed. There's only a certain amount of inventory that you have. And the biggest problem that I see in this industry with the millions of hosts that are out there is that we're trying to appeal to everybody. When you appeal to everybody, you appeal to nobody. And another cliche phrase, the, the, the riches are in the niches. So if you can really figure out, number one, who is your ideal guest? So who is the type of guest that is coming to my location? Scottsdale, wherever it may be. 
who is the type of people that are coming to here? Is it all leisure? Is it a mixture of business and leisure? Is it families? Is it solo people? Is it digital nomads? Whoever it may be. So you figure out who that is. So who's coming to the area? And then what you do is you look at your property and it's like, okay, so what is my property good for? And then, you know, has it got a pool? Has it got, you know, a real good bed to bath ratio? Has it got private parking? Really good Wi-Fi. And then what you then do is you go, okay, so this is who's coming to the area. This is what my property is good for. Now, what can I do with my property to really speak to my to my niche? And as a, a, a prime example, a, a person that I was speaking to, uh, she had a, a couple of properties on the coast. Some amazing seaside properties. You could see the beach, see the sea literally from the window. And uh, the location where she was at was well known for, for surf. And she was trying to decide on who her avatar was. And the property, the way it was laid out, it was repelling who her ideal guest was because that was ideal for surfers to come away for a surf break. Um, but she was doing the exact opposite. So a little couple of tweaks. So for example, by by stipulating in the listing on a marketing on her social media, like literally how close the property was to the beach by putting in some surf racks, private parking, all of that, that stuff, she was able to really focus and niche down on her avatar and her ideal guests. And with that, the people that walked through her door were the ideal people. They literally, as soon as they landed in the door, it was like an instant five-star review because it matched everything what that guest wanted and needed. So you didn't have people rocking up and pulling guns on cleaners and all that <laughs> stuff. So <laughs> I love that. So here's what I like about it. As a real estate investor, we don't have to think about the avatar of who's going to be staying in our house. It's someone who needs a place to live. Maybe I might think, what kind of job does this person have? So what kind of rent can they afford? That's about as far as it goes. But as a host of a uh, a hospitality asset, you do need to be thinking about that. So what are some of the mistakes that you see people making, Mark, that are real estate investors approaching it with the real estate investor mindset that don't understand that they're actually becoming a hospitality host? Um, well, this is the main thing is that everybody comes to it and they sort of take off the hospitality hat. Um, I don't mind. I don't care where you've come from or what niche or where it's interested you're coming into. As soon as you have strangers coming to stay in your property, you're in my world of, of hospitality. So you always have to think hospitable first, like hospitality is, is the main, main part of it. And if you can always think about making sure that that guest has got the most amazing stay in your property, then you'll win time and time again. There's a saying that that I I, I came out when, when I created the book, Direct Playbook, which is the book that I put out this year, that the tagline was, there's a story behind every booking. And I don't care if a guest is staying with you for work or for leisure or for a family stay, there's a story behind the booking. It's up to you as a host, or it's up for you as your team to make sure that you can uncover what that story is and how can you make that stay memorable? Because if you can make that stay memorable, what it means is that you will not have to market your business. Your guests will become super fans and they will market your business for you. The referral networks, the, the, the comeback ability, all of that is, is there for years to come. But the first thing you've got to do is you've got to sort of take off that real estate hat, take off the numbers hat, take off the air DNA hat <laughs> and just put on that hospitality hat for a second and just sort of think, okay, what can I do to make sure that I can make my guests stay as best as possible? That's super fair. I think I always say this. I think I was telling you this too, David, because you, you just bought like 15 short-term rentals in like two hours. Uh, I don't know. It took you like a month. But either way, you know, you were talking about the idea of getting a property manager. And I was like, well, first, I honestly think to anybody that buys 15 properties or that's really getting into this, that you should really be in the weeds of your business for a little bit. You know, if you want to go the property manager route, that's totally fine. Um, do that. But Give yourself two, three, four weeks at a minimum to just understand how guests communicate, how they communicate specifically about your property. What are the common questions that come up about your property? Because I have a lot of different Airbnb listings and the the common questions that I get for each listing are wildly different. You just, you never really know, right? And people ask you things and you're like, wow, okay, there's something not clear about my property or there's something super appealing to my property and you sort of find out your guest avatar, kind of to your point, Mark. But either way, for me, I, I like people being entrenched in the nuts and bolts of their businesses before they hand it off, just because if you learn how to be, uh, you know, how to drive up the hospitality and how to be a good host, then you know how to manage a property manager. That's always been my, my stance. Well, let me just say, I would not recommend anyone else do what I did. 15 short-term rentals at one time <laughs> has turned out to be a very taxing endeavor 
that I don't think was very wise to get into. I do that often. Mentally taxing, um, not not financially taxing. That should yes. probably help you out on that. That's exactly what I'm taxes, getting at. Right? I've actually had to, I had somebody who was helping uh, manage my portfolio that I had to let go because they couldn't keep up with the, the strain of all that goes into this. Plus a lot of them had rehabs and it's a very challenging time for me right now trying to keep up with all of this stuff that's going on. So I think you're right. It would be much better to t- have taken this at like one or two at a time. So I don't want anyone to hear this and think that they should go copy <laughs> what I did there. That's been a, it's been a little bit crazy. And I actually was thinking, Mark, maybe I'd hire you as a consultant to see what could be done to get some of this uh, stuff off the ground a little bit quicker. But you do make a very good point there, Rob, that you want to understand the asset class that you are getting into. Mark, I think our audience would really benefit from uh, any specific examples like the one you gave of the surfer home where someone approached it thinking just like an investor, like, oh, on a spreadsheet, this is what it should bring in and this is my occupancy and it's all science, there's no art. And then you seeing, hey, here's some tweaks somebody made on the art side, they added surf racks, they um, advertised it was very close to the beach that it actually impacted the, the numbers that the property brought in. Yeah, well, there's, there's another great story as well. And when we, when we talk about sort of hospitality, and and how you can really make sure that your business will thrive on on the other end. We had um, a, a lady that was part of the Boosley community, and she had a, a lakeside property. And this is what I'm talking about, like old school market and how it can really help your your, your business. Um, she had a, a person book at her lakeside property, and on the note, and they booked via they booked direct, and they booked, and on the note it said, um, "We're really looking forward to coming stay at your lakeside property." Uh, little Timmy's ninth birthday, he, he, he's wanting to, to learn how to fish. And what the host did is what most people would do. And the most problem problematic thing that people would do is they would just look at that note and go, Oh, that's nice. Little Timmy's birthday. Well, that's fantastic. But what this lady did was, um, on the day of arrival, she went to the, to, to the, uh, fish and bait and tackle shop and she bought a fishing rod and just a couple of other things like some bait tackle, etc. And, uh, went five to 10 minutes out of her way. So she did a meet and greet with, with, with the family. And before the family arrived, she put the, the, the little gift with a little card on the dock, just as the people parking up and going up to the property, the family arrives and they see, uh, they, they see that note and they open it and they go, Dear Timmy, have an amazing ninth birthday. Here's um, a little gift from us, the property manager, just to get you on your way in your fishing journey. And instantly, that was a little tweak that they had made to their business, a little gift that cost no more than $30, $40. And it impacted massively because what happened was that guest instantly pictures Instagram, social media. So they had the social proof right there. And then when they went home, they were talking about it to their friends and the family members. And then it was that same guest repeat, repeat, but for the next five years, brought their friends with them and told all of their coworkers, et cetera. So a little gift like that, a little shift, a little look at the property, a little, okay, what can I do to make this guest experience even better? And it resulted in um, you know, thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of direct bookings. And it's all because of one little tweak that they made. And that's just like one little, little example. I think one thing that every host should be doing right now, everybody that has got a short term rental business, um, whether it's one property, five properties or 10 properties or more, you should all be looking right now and just sort of look at the property, look at the area and go, well, what can I do to make sure that I can make sure that the ideal guest that I want to walk through this door make sure that it's as easy as bookable as possible and making it, making it stand out. One, one of the easiest things you can do right now is to get a, a little floor plan, a little uh, cartoon floor plan drawn. You can get someone on Fiverr, costs about $20, $30. And what it does is it lays out your property instantly from an Airbnb listing or a Verbo listing or even a social media, because there's so many people that book with you first time without properly knowing the layout of your property. So little tweaks like that, that you can do that will really make sure that your property stands out and, you know, it, it really will help getting those heads on beds. Yeah. So Mark, we, we, we covered that. We covered the, the idea of the, what hosts are kind of neglecting as they move from real estate into the hospitality side of things. We've also covered why relying on one platform is bad. I mean, I think w- one of the big reasons there obviously is guests have a lot of leverage and, you know, if you have all your eggs in one basket and you get shut down or hacked or whatever, your business is effectively over until you're able to restore your account. So for people that are going into the direct booking option, and even to clarify this for people at home that may not know what we mean, we mean if you were to buy a domain like rawbuilthomes.com 
Uh, I should have brought that before I said this, but robbillathomes.com and you can go and actually book your stay through my personal website. And I'm the one that controls basically all the customer service and everything like that. For people that are going that route and just for people that are still even using OTAs, do you feel that hosts are neglecting the security and the guest screening that comes along with guests that are booking stays at their home? And what are some tips here for for people that are you know, still booking on those sites and even through a direct booking website? Yeah, this is definitely something that um, is, is, is a big pain point. And so many people are saying, you know, a guest has booked and they've shown up with X amount of people. It started really during the lockdowns where, uh, especially over here in the UK, um, all of the nightclubs were closed. You couldn't really go on a proper night out. Uh, so what was happening was people were booking a stay. They were booking a stay um, in their town or their city. They say, yep, yeah, two people are turning up. <laughs> and then before you know it, there's 16 people and there's a party going on in, in your in your short-term rental business. So there's there's a big problem with with security and guest screening. L- luckily now, like compared to when I first got started in 2011, properly in short-term rentals, there's so many providers and software and, and service tools that are available to short-term rental hosts, people who have one, two, three, four, five properties that wasn't there before. So um, one of the best things that everybody can be doing is looking to getting guest screening uh, software set up as soon as possible. There's one over here in, in the UK that is a worldwide brand that's called Superhog, uh, S-U-P-E-R-H-O-G. That's a really good one. And, and what it basically does when a guest books, what happens is they get a little notification. They have to verify who they say they are. So it adds that guest screening element. And when it comes to it, even if a guest books via a platform or if they book direct, you've got to make sure that um, you are protecting your investment at the end of the day. And, you know, a a lot of people talk about making sure that you've got exterior uh, cameras set up. Um, Obviously don't do the interior cameras. That gets you into a lot of trouble, but the exterior cameras, making sure you've got relevant guest screening. But again, it's still something that so many people don't do. And it's those guests that don't put those simple blueprint in place, the foundations in place to have a very successful short-term rental business are the ones that you see that come onto Reddit that come into the Facebook groups and, and complain about X, X, Y, or Z guest. All right. That's a great point, Mark. I, I like that you highlight that guests like screening and protecting your investing is another part of the hospitality business that you don't have to think about with typical real estate investing. When it comes to what hosts are putting on their profile, what are some things that are commonly missed? Yeah. So one of the big things that I show hosts how to do is how you can sort of take someone from an OTA into a, a direct booking. And one of the best ways and the best places to start is your listing. You're literally your profile on, on, on Airbnb. And everybody has the ability to make your listing on Airbnb look super professional, but at the same time, showcasing your business and your brand. And so what it will end up doing is it will take a guest from Airbnb to a Google search where hopefully they will then click on your direct booking website. So one of the main things that, that people can do is go onto your Airbnb listing right now and you've got your first six pictures, which are obviously um, your most important pictures. We call them your hero images or your, your unique selling pictures. And what you can do on there is you can watermark them with your business and your brand. So say that you've got the the, the Rob house and the David house, uh, but the overall brand is, uh, let's just say, the, the Mark business brand. Then what you can do is on, on these individual listings, you can put your logo of your business on there. So instantly to the user, because as a user, User, as a as a as a generation of of of, uh, of people that are using these, we skim read at best. So you're looking at the images, and instantly every single one of them is watermarked, so the user knows that okay, so this is a proper business. This isn't somebody who is just listing their you know a house for a hobby. This is somebody that's properly doing this as a business. And then the next hack that you can do is in your profile. So everybody on Airbnb, and this is really cool. You don't get this on Verbo and you don't get this on booking.com, but everybody on Airbnb has a profile and you'd be amazed at how many people, when the guest is going through, so your future potential guest is going through the booking process, they actually go and check out your profile and you can actually put a little bio in. This is one of the most under tap resources that I see on the platform from hosts that we do marketing reviews for is you've got that first little bit of the bio and the first line in particular you can introduce yourself as, hey, my name is Mark. I'm part of uh, Boostly b and Please check out our online reviews. They're really good. Now, we're not directly saying on our Airbnb profile to go check out boostly.co.uk. We're not directing people to a domain because Airbnb will obviously shut that down. But what we're saying is we're introducing ourselves as being a business 
in ourselves as a property management company or just a, a professional business on Airbnb, but to go and check out our online reviews, they're rather good. So instantly what happens there is that the, the guests will see that, they'll go to Google, they'll type in your business name in, in the location where you're at, and obviously then your your website will pop up, any social media that you have, and obviously your Google business listing. So those are two things that everybody can do right now. It will take a couple of minutes, but it instantly will separate you from everybody else. When everyone's zigging, you got to zag in this industry. And so that's one of the two core things that every every Airbnb host will should be doing. Yeah, I uh oh man, as an educator in this space, it does kill me whenever someone has a listing that they'll ask for feedback on it, for example, It'll be like, "What do you think?" and then they have like one sentence for the whole entire listing and then photos that were taken on a cell phone and I'm like, "Dude, you got to spend like an hour just writing what this place is, write a write up about it, and then spend like two hundred and fifty to five hundred bucks on professional photos. And if you do that, you'll increase your booking significantly. So, in the vein of you got to zig when others zag, you know, a lot of people in this space think beds and heads. That's all I really need, right? To to have a successful Airbnb business is just putting as many people I can into a house. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, no, you're right. Um, it's, this is more than just a heads on beds game. It really is about the guest experience. And now more than ever, your guests that are staying in your property, they're looking at the amenities as much as it is for a real good pillow and a real good comfy bed to sleep on. So for example, one of the most important things that Airbnb is going to be focusing on in 2023, and this is based on all of the searches that they get and all of the data that they have is Wi-Fi. Like your Wi-Fi speed is going to be crucial, even more so that it's only a matter of time before in the filter of your Airbnb listing will a future potential guest be able to filter the internet speed depending on what property you show. So right now you can go into your into your property, you can open up your Airbnb app and you can do a speed test and you can submit that speed test to Airbnb and they'll say if it's poor, good or excellent. So if you have really good Wi-Fi, you should be definitely tapping into that and taking full advantage of it because again, it just makes your property stand out so much more. And not only just talk about it on Airbnb and your listing sites, but talk about it on social, talk about it on, on your website as well. Talk about that because the digital nomad or the slow mad, which is going to be a new phrase in 2023, this is going to get even more popular. Uh, Brian Chesky even said um, in an interview that he believes that it's only a matter of time before 50% of the US workforce is working from home or working from a, a short-term rental property. So amenities is massive. Also as well, the other massive thing is, is the kitchen. Go into the utensils that you provide, uh, whether it's an air fryer or whatever it may be, a decent coffee machine, a decent coffee bar. Make sure that you put in a little bit of time and an extra bit of budget into the amenities as much as it is that real comfy pillow and that real comfy bed. 100% agree. I think probably over the years, the number one, I won't say complaint, but I guess feedback that people give me, and it's, it's less now because I've addressed it, but it's usually people that are like, hey, loved your place, would love for your kitchen to have been stocked a little bit more. And so now when I'm teaching people how to do this, I'm always like, look, just go to TJ Maxx or uh, I don't I don't know if you guys have TJ Maxx over there, but you know, like Ross, Michaels, wherever some of these uh, more bargain places, they have a whole section that's just kitchen stuff like, you know, uh, can openers and wine openers, all that kind of stuff. And just spend like a hundred bucks on all the little knickknacks and the the lemon squeezers and all that kind of stuff, because people are always super excited when it's there and really bummed when it's not. And even to that point these days, when a guest says, hey, do you have this item in the kitchen, I'm usually the first person to say, hey, I don't, but tell you what, go buy it. I can, I'm sure I could use it in the listing and I'll reimburse you for it. And people are always like, oh my God, that's amazing. Most of the time they don't, but I'm always willing to, right? If it's like a $10, you know, uh, lemon squeeze or whatever, but other guests will probably use it. So I, I think that the kitchen is so important these days because a lot of people tend to book Airbnb so that they can actually cook, cook there. Yeah. And and also as well with, with with the coffee bar, if you go and do something a little bit unique by getting local coffee beans and whatnot, it instantly makes your property Instagrammable. And the more you can make your property Instagrammable, the more that your guests will take a picture and they'll upload it to their socials. Because the, the number one time when your guests are taking pictures is when they're on holiday, is when they can show off to their friends back home that they're on vacation, staycation, workation. So the more that you can make your property Instagrammable and they can tag you in, then that's how you get that social media word of mouth and that virality just thriving. Yeah. So uh, effectively, let's juice up the amenities, right? Let's make sure that the kitchen is great, that the internet is fast. I'm curious, is there any uh, 
tactical advice there on increasing internet speeds? Is there, is it like a special router, like a mesh system or anything like that? Or is it just going with the fastest package that your internet provider provides? It all depends on, you know, what your fit, what you have available. So at the end of the day, you could put all of the cool little cool mesh things and all that jazz. But if you've only got a certain amount of speed coming into your house, then you're screwed. Uh, luckily now, doesn't matter where you are in the world, uh, Starlink and these other solutions, these satellite solutions are making more people rural or wherever you've got more options uh, available. So, but it's only going to come a matter of time where having Wi-Fi and having quick Wi-Fi, especially for the Gen Z generation. And people think Gen Z is like a teenagers. Gen Z now in 2022 is 25. These are people that are going to be paying money to stay at your property. So you've got to make sure that a generation that are literally born with, with one of these cell phones, literally in their hand 24 seven, you've got to make sure that you've got, uh, you've got Wi-Fi and you've got good Wi-Fi. Don't just have like, say I've got Wi-Fi and it's like two megabyte speed. <laughs> you know, it's got to be decent. It's got to be double digits. Yeah, for sure. I've got a couple of listings that don't have Wi-Fi and we make it as well known as possible. And it's like, hey, it does not have Wi-Fi. And then sure enough, they check in and they're like, what's the password? I don't see it. And I'm like, I told you there's no Wi-Fi. We would offer it if we could. But that that's something I'm always happy to spend a hundred bucks a month on simply because, yeah, we it, it's super important. Okay. I have to ask you, Rob, is the location not offer Wi-Fi? Is that why you don't have it? it it's like, yeah, it's too secluded. The like We can't even get HughesNet out there, which is like eight megabytes per second. Wow. So there's just is not internet well, what about the thing Elon Musk is doing? What's that going to be called? Starlink. There's a there's a wait list for that um, everywhere. I mean, it is possible. Finally, one of the properties, my Gatlinburg property, I got the email from Starlink to set it up. And I was like, oh, it actually happened. But it's not always readily available. Do you think that Starlink will change all the emails that old people use that have sbcglobal.net? As their email domain name, are they all going to? Are you are you Starlink? sweating over there because you still have the SBC Global Donut and your Hotmail, uh, David Green at That's Hotmail. That's right, Rob. I've got a Hotmail <laughs> <It's> account. <right. laughs> Back when email was created. Um, <laughs> so, Mark, we've talked about uh, ex- having a great experience, amenities, everything that that leads up to this moment, but. There comes a time where a guest leaves, right? And that's the end of the stay. So what aren't hosts doing to follow up with their guests? And do you feel like this is a crucial aspect for marketing your business in the future to those guests? Yeah, and this is where you can get those juicy direct bookings so easy and simple. Um, and, and this is the cool thing is that it doesn't cost any money. It literally takes a couple of minutes of your time, but you just got to reach out to your guests. We are very lucky that uh, Airbnb, for example, they give you the phone number. They don't give you the email address, but they give you the phone number of the guest. And this is where, you know, it, for a lot of people, it may be a little uncomfortable, but it's all about, you know, becoming comfortable about feeling uncomfortable. Pick up your phone and call your guest. Just when they check out, if it's not you, if you're super busy, get a member of your team to do it and just say, Hey, Rob, I really appreciate you uh, supporting a local business and, you know, come, come in to stay with us. Can I just ask, you know, why did you book with us? You know, ask a lot of who, where, why, what, when questions like what did you do when when you when you were here why did you go and do that x y and z and then at the end of the conversation if it's gone well just say hey rob we really appreciate you we really loved you as a guest you know thank you very much for that five star review hint hint uh by the way do you know anyone so really important four words that so many people don't use but it, it will be everything in you in, in your business in, in in terms of marketing and getting more bookings is do you know anyone so do you know anyone who's coming to the area do you know anyone who's coming here for work it's a really good one to ask anybody who stayed for like a business day uh, do you know anyone that needs to come to x y or z and at that moment that person will say a couple of things number one no <laughs> or yes uh, or i'm maybe I'm, I'm not sure so if they say no, just say, listen, no worries. Uh, by the way, if, if you ever do know anybody that's coming to, who needs a place to stay, please bear us in mind, recommend us. And if they book, we'll give you a X in return, like Amazon vouchers or whatever it may be, bottle of beer, what, burrito, whatever, whatever floats your boat. Uh, but in the other time, if they say yes and say, actually I do as a friend, David, who's coming to town, um, they say, brilliant. Do you mind, you know, sharing his contact information or setting up a group chat on, on messenger or, you know, or whatever it may be on email. And if they book and they mention you, then, uh, you know, I'm more than happy to give you a, you know, X in return. X could be $50 Amazon voucher or, or whatever it may be. Because when you ask that question and you want somebody to do something, you've got to dangle the carrot by dangling the carrot, they're more likely to take action. And that's the most crucial thing. But if you do that consistently, if you can do that for say out of every five guests that check out, if you can call one out of five, I guarantee that what will start to happen is you will build up a pool of referrals. And if you can do that successfully, like I said at the start, 
you will never have to properly market, pay money for Google ads, Facebook ads again, because you'll have a referral network of your guests who will be your super fans who will just keep referring you and referring you to their friends, family and coworkers for months and years to come. And I know it works because that's exactly what we did our business to Granary and, and how we dealt at the farm stay business. Yeah, this is a really great approach in my mind, simply because screening is such a big deal, right? And so if you have a guest that comes, you've screened them, they're staying with you, let's say through Airbnb, and they leave your place in decent condition, then we can probably make the assumption, obviously, you don't want to always assume, but if they go, if you reach out to them, and they book through your direct booking website for a second time in the next year, they're probably gonna leave your place in good condition again, right? And then if they're referring you to all their different friends in the network, then again, those people know good people tend to know good people. And hopefully, you kind of build up this referral network of people that treat your house, uh, you know, pretty well, right? So it kind of alleviates the concern of like having strangers in your house. And 93, so 93% of purchases are made on the back of social proof. So if, if, if it's you as a friend is Rob recommending David and it's the David is much more likely to book than if it's just me straight messaging David saying, Hey, come and stay at that place. You know what I mean? So it's, it's with that, with that social proof is, is, is everything. So yeah, it go, it goes a long way. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it, even on my end, I, I'm looking at the social proof, right? Guests that are trying to book my place. And, you know, if they have no reviews, I'm definitely going to be a little bit more, uh, I don't know, apprehensive about accepting that booking over someone that has, you know, 20 five star reviews on Airbnb. And then if I see someone that has a 4.5 uh, as a guest, I'm always like, well, what, why is that? You know, I'll go in and I'll read all the reviews. And if most of the reviews are good, usually it's, nine good reviews and one like so-so review, then I, I kind of go forward with that, right? Because it's nice to know the, the proof, right? The reviews of, of the people that are staying at your place and vice versa, people that are staying at your place probably want to know, right? And so that's why you say in your listing, hey, go read our online reviews and then they can read about it and then feel assured there. All right, so we're going to move on to the next segment of our show. It is going to be a modified version of the deal deep dive called the direct deep dive. <laughs> Mark, in this segment of the show, Rob and I are going to take t turns asking you questions about your direct booking system. Question number one, where can you set up a direct booking? Is there a specific portal to use? So the, the main important thing that you need is a property management software, otherwise known as a PMS. Um, the unfortunate thing is there is 1,400 plus property management software tools. Um, the good news is, is that there's about 10 to 12 top ones. And those are the ones to focus on. Um, you may have heard of a couple of them, Guesty, Hostaway, Hostfully, et cetera. Uh, if you want a, a blog post about this, I've literally done one on, on Boostly. So boostly.co.uk forward slash PMS. That is where you get started because when you've got a property management software tool, it helps you create everything that you need to put in place to build a direct booking business. So the guest screening that we spoke about, it will link into that. Um, if you want to be on more than one platform, for example, booking.com, Verbo, and uh, an Airbnb, it's all programmed via the PMS and it all directly speaks to it. And the best thing is you can then create a Stripe account to take direct payments and you can also create your own direct booking website. So it, this is the most important thing to get started with is getting a property management software tool. Question number two, how do you build out the communication with the potential customer? My old school favorite is picking up the phone and giving them a call. And I like to do it at, at the end of the stay but also the start of the booking process as well. So when a reservation comes in, the best thing to do to, to sort of not have any cancellations, uh, to make sure that there's no um, miscommunication, pick up the phone, give them a call, have a chat with them, figure out why they booked, what can you do to make that stay even better. Uh, that's one of the best things that everybody can be looking to do, taking this old school in a new school world. Awesome. All right. If somebody wants to do this, what does it cost to set up a direct booking website? So the, the cool thing is, as you are getting started in this game, so let's just say one property, it's actually free. Um, you can go to so many free providers to have a direct booking website. But just like with anything in the world, as you level up your business, you need to level up your tech stack. And, you know, as you get to maybe three, four or five properties, then you'll have to pay a little bit of money to, to actually do so. There's many providers out there. There's many ones that, that do it. Um, Boostly, obviously, the elephant in the room, we offer a service that we, we can help with that. Just go to boostly.co.uk. But you can start off by anywhere, sort of a couple of hundred bucks. And then the more you grow, let's say you get past 10 properties and 15 properties, then you want to look for a pro solution where guests can book directly on your site. 
You can have things like live chat, retargeting and all those cool stuff. And that's going to cost you a couple of grand. But when you get to that level of 10 plus properties, the money that you will spend on a website pales in significance with what you'll be paying to commission cost to, to Airbnb and all these, all these other online searches. So the, the best thing to do at that moment in time, invest the money as you level up your business and you'll be, you'll be set for years to come. Awesome. Question number four, how do you measure your success? Are there any KPIs or key performance indicators for, for measuring success in this world? The best one for me, and uh, not only do I look at this, but investors or potential buyers of your short-term rental business will be looking at a very high ratio of direct bookings coming into your business. So if you are looking to sell your business and say you are 90% reliant on one platform for your industry, if you have your reservations coming in, they won't look at you as well as if you've got 65% direct and then 35% reliant on other people. The, the, the way that I like to describe this is you've got to look at Airbnb as your banker. Now, um, the banker basically is when, uh, when I was, I'm a happily married man now, but when I was single and I would go on a night out, uh, I would be basically looking to take uh, a lady home to do some horizontal dancing with at some point in during the evening. But as the night go on, it got to two o'clock in the morning. I would always have my banker on hand that I could call uh, if, if I wanted to do so. And this is exactly how we need to look at Airbnb. They need to be your banker. So Airbnb is your banker. Direct bookings is the one that you marry. And so this is the main thing that what you need to do to measure your success. 65% direct, 35% OTA. Is banker like backup plan like you got one in the bank that's the bank that's the backup plan that's my uh that, that, that's the 2 a.m call and it worked both ways you know I, I was the i was the banker but this is where you gotta look at airbnb airbnb need to be your banker you go and marry the direct bookings that's there's a, a lot of business principles that work that same way you've got the home run pitch you're looking for and then you've got well if i don't get what i want here's my backup plan at least i could get on base and so i think that's very wise and also very funny analogy all right, last question of the direct booking deep dive. Let's say you want to convert an OTA like an Airbnb or a VRBO listing into a direct booking. What can you do? So um, the two things that we spoke about are very handy in a, in a reactive way, um, but a proactive way could be when a booking comes in. So the, the premise is that you've already knocked off number one where you've got your PMS portal. So when a booking comes in from Airbnb or Verbo or booking.com, uh, if your PMS is set up right, an email notification will go out to the guest. And a, a real proactive way of converting an OTA booking into a direct booking is in that email template, uh, you basically say to the guest, and this is something you can set up once and you can set and forget. And the terminology terminology should go, hey, Rob, thank you very much for your booking a stay at, at Boostly b and um, Just to confirm, the date of arrival is the 1st of December. You're checking out on the 4th. Uh, please make sure you read the rest of this email because your checking information is really important. And the way it should go is if you have booked with us directly, i.e. email, um, phone call or website, your check-in time is 1 p.m. If you have booked via an OTA, i.e. Airbnb, Verbo or booking.com, your check-in time is 5 p.m. So what you are doing right there, psychologically, you are punishing somebody from booking via an, a third party and they will see that and they will go, well, hang on a second. If I'd have booked direct, my check-in time is one, but because I've booked via Airbnb, the check-in time is 5 p.m. The next line of text is important, but if you want to amend anything about your stay, here's my personal cell phone number and email. Call me at any point and we can rectify that for you. We would do this for our emails that we went out to everybody. And we had about a 60 to 70% success rate of them calling us. And they would go, hey, Mark, I've got your email about the check-in time. If I'd have booked direct... Um, I would have obviously got an earlier check-in at one o'clock. And the main thing to realize here is that when somebody comes and stays with you, they're going to be traveling from a couple of hours, flying in maybe, maybe it's for an event or maybe it's for X, Y, or Z. And they don't want to be hanging around before they can check in with you. So they're much more likely to take action and book of you direct. So the conversation would go, can I flip it to a direct booking? How do I do that? And it's super simple. This is where you just take over with, with, with a little bit of nows and you say, yep, yeah, sure thing, Rob, no problem. So all I need just for security reasons, can you just confirm what your email address is? Again, you don't get that email from the OTA, so you get that email. And just say, can you just confirm for, uh, your, your card details? Brilliant. And you've got everything that you need. And just say, just do me a favor. Um, can you just open up the Airbnb app or the booking.com app? Can you cancel that stay for me? Because I can't do it for you. Fantastic. As soon as you've done that, I will book it you in and you'll get a confirmation directly for us and you'll get that new check-in time. 
And it works in so many levels because number one, the major kickback I get to that, people say, well, hang on a second, you're cancelling an Airbnb listing. Why would you do that? I'm not cancelling the reservation. The guest is cancelling it. One in three OTA reservations results in a cancellation. So because it's them doing it and not you doing it, it doesn't flag up on any radar on, on any, any, any OTAs. And it's totally within the T's and C's as well. And by doing that, again, you've, you've, you've basically canceled an OTA reservation. You've got a direct one in the bag. And I say we had about 60 to 70% success rate on that, just from having one little email template that went out after a booking. All right. Thank you for that, Mark. That is going to move us into the last segment of our show. This is the world famous. Famous for. In this segment of the show, Robin, I ask every guest the same four questions and we will fire them off at you. Question number one, Mark, what is your favorite real estate book? So I'm going to keep it bigger pockets. Uh, Avery Carl's short-term rental, long-term wealth. Um, love the book and I've got to know Avery quite well. And yeah, I think that's an, an, a really good one for everybody in real estate who's looking to get into short-term rentals. Cool. Number two, favorite business book. Uh, I've always got it to hand. I've got it with me now. It's Tools of Titan by uh, Tim Ferriss. And I'm a massive Tim Ferriss fanboy. I've, had, I've, known, I've been listening to him and watching him since 2016. Um, that book is amazing because it took 200 of his best episodes, all of his interviews with his guests. There we go, David. It's, it's right there. And he put it into a book. It is a huge book. And it's one that um, you don't have to read it from page one to page uh, you know, 500 or whatever it is, you can just dip into different chapters as, as you go. And as far as, as business, it's got a section on health. It's got a section on wealth and it's, it's by far the one that I always come back to is, is tools of Titans. Hmm. All right. I thought, uh, I thought you were going to say who not, who not how, since you fun story here, Mark mailed me a copy of who not how with a note that said, this book is going to change your life. I think. Funny you mentioned that because I was, you know, there's so many books that you could give. And, and I remember when you interviewed Alex Hormozzi, his answer was, it depends on where you are in your journey. Now, me personally, right now, I'm on a massive hiring spree and, and who not how is like top of mind clockwork, who not how. And I message, I sent it to Rob because it, like, there was a lot of things that he said that resonated. But the one that I always come back to is, is Tools of Titans, massive, a massive fan. And I feel it doesn't matter where you are in your journey, Tools of Titans is one that you can come to at loads of different stages. All right. I've got that noted. I have a... Um, a notepad here whenever guests say their books that they recommend. I always write down the ones that sound intriguing for the day that I possibly read a book again. I'm still I'm still working through Burr right now, but honestly, like, you know, I'm looking, this is going to be my year. I'm going to get two books in. I do the same thing with interesting hairstyles that I see guests come in. <laughs> and the odds of me actually acting on that are about the same as Rob reading a book. <laughs> oh, it's probably accurate. It's probably accurate. Um Three, when, <laughs> when you're not busy uh, creating direct booking websites and just totally shaking up the short-term rental world, Mark, what are some of your favorite hobbies? Well, at the moment, it's sleep. Like we mentioned at the start, mm. I've got, uh, just mm. had a baby girl three weeks ago. So <laughs> whenever I can have sleep, that's, that's a big part. Um, and the other thing is, my, my, basically, my main passion is soccer, football. Liverpool Football Club. I'm actually going to go after this episode and watch them probably lose tonight, which is a shame because they're a very good soccer team. Um, but but yeah, let's say Liverpool. And if we've got any Liverpool fans watching, please send me a message on Instagram. Come and say hi at Boosley UK. And uh, yeah, that's my big passion is Liverpool and creating children, it looks like. You don't sound like you're from Liverpool. Are you from that area? I, I, am, I am not from that area. It's the other area of the Pennines, but... Um, my granddad got me onto Liverpool when he was alive. He, uh, my first ever game, my granddad took me to me and my cousin. Um, he was a he was a he was a a big fan back in the day, and uh, I will never ever forget that forget that experience. Um, but I've just I've had it ever since the age of ten or eleven. Um, but yeah, good good scouse knowledge there, David. Well, which mm, part of the UK are you from? I've been trying this whole time to peg it. <laughs> it sounds like you've got a British accent with a hint of Irish that just keeps showing up and I can't place it. So I'm a, I'm a little bit of a rogue because I've traveled so much America and Australia and everywhere. I've sort of lost my, my proper accent. Uh, but I'm like, a, I'm a, one of these chameleons where if I hang around somebody for so long, I will just tap into their, 
accent. So if I go and stay in Liverpool for a week, I'll come uh-huh. out sounding like I'm from Liverpool. If you know, if I hang around in Don't Australia, I'll stick around. You say <laughs> <laughs> kind of cold. <laughs> so yeah. basically, yeah, <laughs> that's how I sound with this cold. That that sounds like I'm from Liverpool. There, yeah. they've got like that Middle Eastern ha <laughs> with everything they're saying. So here, I want to do this before I ask you the next question, Rob. Speak in your English accent, and Mark, you're gonna tell us where oh. this where Rob's accent would be placed if he lived in the UK. Not really my bag. <laughs> See, uh, <laughs> the movie Forgetting Sarah Marshall, when uh, Russell Brand gets shipped, like, has a surfing accident, and then Paul Rudd's character goes and comes over and goes, you sound like you're from London. That is basically... <laughs> so I'm Paul Rudd in that. You are Paul Rudd in, in that. Russell you Brand, like you're from isn't it? London. <laughs> you sound like someone trying to sound like they're from London. That's what he's telling you. Not really. All right, now we're going to do mine, Mark. It's not going to be necessarily British, but it will be from somewhere in the UK. If you had to say where you think I'm talking from, what does this accent sound like, Marke? <laughs> that's two hours north of me. That's uh, good old Scotland. Aye, that's right. My grandparents are from Glasgow. And they've spoken like this my entire life. Mm, good, good. As a little kid, I thought everybody's grandparents sounded like they were Scottish. I just thought that's like a grandparent thing. I didn't know that that was my grandparents. So the first time I met like someone else's grandparents and they didn't sound that way, my five-year-old brain was like, What? Like, why do they sound like your mom and your dad? They're supposed to sound different. That's how I thought that it thought that it worked. All right. Next question. In your opinion, Mark, at Swimmingly and Pun worked together pretty well, didn't they? I didn't even expect that pun to have a pun. It's a pun within a pun. It's punception happening on the podcast. In your opinion, Mark, what sets apart successful investors from those who give up, fail, or never get started? Uh, procrastination is the killer of all good ideas, plans, and businesses. And somebody once said to me when I first got going in this is the key to success is imperfect action applied at speed. So I always stand by that. Just done is better than perfect. Just just go and get it done. That's Beautiful. S- strikingly similar to Rob's dancing style. That's true. I'm more of a vertical dancer. I'm still mastering the cha-cha <laughs> slide. Well, I'm a horizontal <laughs> dancer. That's why I've got four kids. And what was the strategy there? Imperfect action done what was it? So uh, imperfect action applied at speed. Applied the at key speed. to success. Yes. That describes Rob perfectly. All right, Rob. That's right. Hey, don't trample on my... This is my question. This is the one question I get all podcasts, Dave. Number five. That's actually more of a statement. Mark, tell us where people can find out more about you on the internet. So one place, one place only. Just head over to Amazon and go grab this. Book Direct Playbook. Go grab that copy, please. Uh, and in there is my Instagram, where you can come and find me on the Instagram. Thank you very much, chaps. Much right appreciated. That's right. We got Let's have it. a freeway. There we Boom. go. Lovely. Really this appreciate is, that. It's on my goals to read th- this as my second book. You are one of the hundred books competing to be the second book that Rob has ever read. We will see how the book Hunger Games works out in Rob's life. Go. May the odds <laughs> ever be in it. your favor. All right. Uh, before we get out of here, Rob, where can people find out more about you? Oh, you can find me on the old YouTube where I put it all out there. I put everything, my emotions, my trauma, my successes, my victories, my how to win playbook. Um, and yeah, soon enough, uh, you'll, you'll probably see Mark on the channel too. So uh, you can find me over at Rob Built on YouTube at, uh, sorry, on Instagram over at Rob Built. And then if you want to see me dance and do funny little trends on TikTok, you can find me at Rob Bilto. With an O. What about you, David? You can find me at David Green 24 on just about all social media and then on YouTube at David Green Real Estate. I've also been going live on YouTube on Friday night. So join us there. I'm going to start bringing in guests. Maybe Mark himself will join us one to answer all your questions about OTAs and avoiding corporate travel crazy lunacy that we're starting to see within those industries. And if you would be so kind, please go to your favorite podcast app, be it Stitcher, Spotify, Apple Music, whatever we, whatever that's called now, pod, Apple Podcasts, and leave us a review. Those help a ton. We want to get the message out there that Bigger Podcast is preaching to more people. We want to get more people exposed to messages like Mark's and Rob's and the other BP influencers. So please, if you would go leave us a review, we would love you for it, as well as following us on our YouTube channel, which is growing as well. This has been a fantastic show, Rob. I want to give you any last words before we get out of here. I just want to say, you call me an influencer, which is, uh, that's so, that's like the nicest thing you've ever said to me. I, I really appreciate it. You're that. such a millennial that that would be the best <laughs> compliment anyone could ever give you. I hope so. I don't know. It depends on who you talk to. You are the millennial. That's right. Are you old enough to remember that movie, Weird Science? Oh. Uh, Where those nerds create this like really hot girl in a lab and they like fall in love with her. 
what year was that? I mean, I'm a I'm an '80s baby, you know. I was born in '89. Yeah, it's this movie where these two like really nerdy guys create a, a woman in a lab, and she's beautiful, and then she falls in love with them. I think. Well, that's like Rob. If two people created a millennial, it would be him. He is the personification <laughs> of how that looks. Well, Mark, I want to appreciate you for being here, and Rob, thank you for recommending Mark for the podcast. This was a uh, fantastic show, full of very practical, tactical advice that we don't always get. So I want to thank you for that, Mark, and I will let you get out of here. This is David Green for Rob Imperfect Action Done at Speed Abasolo, signing off. <laughs>